Module 2 covers the structure and function of the bacterial cell. Bacterial structure is foundational knowledge that you will need throughout the rest of the course, and this is why we are covering it at the very beginning. We will begin with some general concepts about bacterial structure, and then talk a bit about the tools necessary to work out what these little tiny organisms are doing. We will then get into the heart of the issue, working from the inside to the outside. Starting with the cytoplasm, moving to the membrane, and finally describing the structures present in the outer layers. This module ends looking at the differences between bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Here are the learning outcomes. Here are even more learning outcomes. Yeah, it's a long module. And now we can, be, can begin. For microorganisms, the cell is the organism, and cells are cells. A cell is a basic unit of life. By the way, did you know that the term comes from the work of Robert Hooke? In the 17th century, he was looking at cork under a microscope and commented that the little divisions looked like prison cells, and the name stuck. Every cell has similar components at the macromolecular level. Proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, sugars, and various small molecules. The critical divider between the cell and the environment is the cell membrane. It serves as a barrier, senses the outside world, and holds together all the cell's components. Microorganisms have the same basic life functions as macrobes, and here they are. Number one, a cell must separate its contents from the environment. It must be able to also uptake food stuff from the environment and use it in its metabolism. The cell then releases any accumulated waste back into the environment. Thus, a cell is an open system. Number two, the goal of a living thing is to make more of itself. A cell uses this energy to grow and eventually divide. Number three, some cells can change, often because of a signal from the environment. For example, if nutrient conditions become poor, some cells will differentiate into a spore. Number four, Cells often communicate with other cells, especially in multicellular organisms. We are finding out that even microbial cells will communicate within and beyond their species. Number five, many living things are capable of movement and microorganisms are no exception. Number six, finally, living things evolve. Microorganisms will accumulate mutations over time and change just like any other organism. Traits one, two, and six are common to all living things. Three, four, and five are present in many, but not all microorganisms. You may wonder why microorganisms are small. Why don't we have giant cells spanning several meters? Part of the reason has to do with efficiency. A smaller cell has a larger surface to volume ratio. Consider a one micrometer diameter spherical cell. It has a surface to volume ratio of three. If you increase its size by just one micrometer, its surface to volume ratio drops by half. If you make it four micrometers, its surface to volume ratio is again halved to 0.75. A smaller surface to volume ratio makes it take longer for signals from the outside world to be detected on the inside. So cells remain small. Even in massively large organisms, there are millions of cells preserving the small size of the basic unit of life. Cells can be all sorts of shapes and sizes. There are bacilli, which are rod-shaped, cocci, which are spheres, and spirochetes, which are corkscrew shapes. There are even amorphous square and cells connected by tubes, as shown in the lower right with rhodomicrobium vanillii. All of these types of different diversity are found in the microbial world. So why are there so many different shapes? Cell shape can be, often be dictated by the environment. If you are in a low nutrient environment, a larger surface area can make it easier to acquire nutrients. A larger surface area can manifest as a stalk in a cell. If you need to defend yourself from predators, such as phagocytes that eat cells, or multicellular microbiovores, you may get really big so that they can't get around you or really small so they can't find you. You may have an appendage that helps you attach to the surfaces. 
A cell shape may make it easier for cells to disperse and find new environments. Your shape may make it easier to move through an environment, so motility may be involved. A cell may make a spore, which has a different shape and is part of di differentiation. And finally, why not? Evolution only punishes you if a trait causes an organism to be less competitive. If the cell shape of an organism doesn't cause a disadvantage, then it's fine and it will probably happen. In order to study microorganisms, you have to be able to see them. And essential for visualizing microorganisms is the microscope. There are many different types of microscopes for viewing cells. The light microscope and the phase microscope are present in many instructional microbiology laboratories and many laboratories overall. They allow the visualization of overall shape of a bacterium as well as any large structures. If you want to see structures in finer detail, you have to move to specialized microscopes. An electron microscope can see the fine details of a bacterium, almost to the resolution of large protein complexes. If you want to determine the structure of proteins, then you have to use very powerful methods, one of which is X-ray crystallography. You can read all about these types of microscopes in chapter 30 of the textbook. So let's see how you're doing on understanding which microscopes you would use for various methods. Your brilliant but absent-minded research mentor is terribly excited. You have identified a novel bacterium and it's time to take measurements of it. To first visualize the microbe and determine cell shape, what type of scope would you use? Your bacterium has a novel form of motility that uses a set of pili as if they were stilts. The scientific community is doubtful of your hypothesis. To begin to test your hypothesis, you first have to demonstrate the existence of the pili on the outside of the cell. What type of microscope would you use and why? You have discovered the pili that you hypothesized. You now want to determine the exact structure of the protein that forms the pilis. There is only one protein. What method would you use to do this? Okay, and final question of this quiz. Smaller prokaryotic cells usually grow more slowly than larger cells because they have trouble accessing nutrients. True or false? The answer to the first question is you would use a light microscope to determine just general cell shape. As you want to look at something smaller, such as a pili, which is appendage that is on the outside of the cell, you would then use something that can get to a higher resolution, and that would be a scanning electron microscope. If you want to figure out the structure of a protein, you would use X-ray crystallography. And finally, this last question is false. Smaller organisms can actually grow faster because they can get more nutrients from the environment and they can move their, through their cells more quickly. Now we begin our exploration of bacterial cell structure in detail. We will begin with the cytoplasmic region and move out to the cell membrane and finally finish up with the cell envelope. Remember, even simple cells such as bacteria are complex and highly organized. They are not big bags of enzymes. The cytoplasm is densely packed and highly structured. I love the illustration shown in this slide because it gives a good visual representation of the cytoplasm. I would say that the DNA is a little too thick, but otherwise it's really good. The cytoplasm is not a dilute laboratory solution. It has more of a gel-like trait instead. The cytoplasm contains the nucleoid, the gene expression machinery, most enzymatic reactions, the cytoskeleton, inclusions, which are structures that serve various purposes for the cell, and many solutes. All of these come together to serve the cell's needs, and as you can see, they're really tightly packed together. Let's go through each of these in a little bit more detail. The nucleoid is the region of the DNA in bacterial cells. It is not a nucleus because in most cases there is no nuclear membrane around it. It's not structured into its own separate compartment. It is highly compacted because it has to be. For example, in E. coli, the DNA genome is 1.5 millimeters in length, yet this has to fit in a cell that's only 1.5 micrometers. Thus, the DNA needs to be highly compacted. 
This compaction is achieved by organizing the DNA into loops of about 50,000 base pairs and supercoiling the DNA, which is adding twist to it. This twisting is analogous to when you wind up a rubber band or a piece of string by twisting it, and this will cause it to compact and get much tighter. Taken together, these two treatments will compact the DNA about a thousand fold. DNA binding proteins also help organize the DNA. Now, it is highly compacted, but remember, even in this compacted state, it still needs to be accessible for replication, repair, recombination, tra and transcription. Having said all that there is no membrane that separates the nucleoid, I'm now going to contradict myself and say that in some species of bacteria, they do keep their DNA enclosed in a membrane. The point is to never say never or always. There always seems to be an exception in biology, but for the most part, the nucleoid is not surrounded by a membrane. Inside the cytoplasm, also you will find the gene expression machinery. The heart of this is the ribosome. I'm sure you have heard all about the function of the ribosome in your biology class, and we will discuss it more in module three, the central dogma. Here, I only want to describe its structure. It's 62% RNA and 38% protein, and it's divided into two subunits. The 30S subunit has 21 proteins and one RNA, the 16S ribosomal RNA, of about 1,500 base pairs, while the 50S subunit has 31 proteins and two RNAs, the 5S RNA of 150 base pairs and the 23S RNA of 2,900 base pairs, about. The RNA catalyzes the core enzymatic function of the ribosome. An important point to remember, it's the RNA that catalyzes its core function. It is a dynamic structure that changes shape as it carries out its purpose. Bacteria have a cytoskeleton. While the structure of the cytoskeleton is not visible in the microscope, bacteria do have a cytoskeleton. It is a set of stable yet dynamic protein filament structures that can self-assemble and disassemble and show long-range order within the cell. The cytoskeleton is involved in shape, making cocci different than rods, mechanical strength, intracellular transport, cell movement, chromosome separation, cell division, and polarity. Polarity is determining where the end of the cells are located. And there's a lot of other subcellular organization that they go through depending on the organism. We are going to highlight two important bacterial cytoskeletal proteins. These proteins are common in bacteria. MRAB has a similar structure to actin, which is found in microfilaments and is a protein in your muscles. It is involved in cell shape, polarity, movement of molecules, for example, chromosome separation, and cell wall synthesis. MRAB is found in many rod-shaped bacteria. FTSC is similar to tubulin that is part of microtubules in eukaryotic cells. It is important for cell division, helping to form the Z-ring. The Z-ring is found in most bacteria. On the right is an image of the Z-ring forming in a bacterial cell as it divides. An antibody against the Z-ring has been added to the stain to visualize the bacterium. Attached to the antibody is a fluorescent compound. By shining a UV light on the slide, anywhere the antibody is will fluoresce. You can see that the Z-ring is dictating where the cell divides. We will talk more about this kind of thing in Module 6 on cell division. Cytoskeletal proteins serve many different functions in the cell. They will be involved in chemotaxis, spatial organization, such as cell wall synthesis, and gene expression. The graphic on the right shows a bunch of examples and we will cover these in other modules as we go through the course. Okay, here's another clicking question to check your understanding. If the FTSZ protein became inactive, the cell would probably do what? The correct answer is C, fail to divide and instead make long filaments. Remember that FTSC forms the Z-ring in the cell and is involved in cell division. Compartments and inclusions. 
There are also a number of inclusions in the cell. Inclusions are things visible in the microscope that serve some defined purpose for the cell. Some function for nutrient storage, some function for compartmentalization. For example, carboxysomes accumulate the enzymes needed for CO2 fixation. Some function for movement and orientation. One example here include, includes gas vesicles of cyanobacteria that are used to address the height in the water column. This way the bacterium can get to the optimum amount of light, not too much and not too little. Another example is magnetosomes. These little magnets help bacteria tell up from down in their environment and that can be important. All right, that is it for the cytoplasm. In the next section, we will talk about the membrane.